Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle, my Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Every once in a while a story breaks that just fills my inbox with people asking questions, and this is one of those stories. So you may know that there's a challenge going on in federal court to try to overturn the order in council that banned a whole swath of popular hunting and sporting firearms, notably including the AR-15, but not limited to it. So that's currently working its way through the courts, that's going to take a while, but there's been a development in that proceeding. And that is that Wendy Sukier, and I think that's the pronunciation of her name, I couldn't find a proper pronunciation, I'm not trying to throw shade at that or anything like that, but uh, she applied for status to as an intervener. And so what that means is that she's not directly involved in the case, but she wants to nevertheless uh, have status to go in and then make arguments and potentially present evidence. And that was rejected. So let's have a look at why that was rejected so that we can better understand what happened here. And quite frankly, it's a little embarrassing for her. So let's uh, have a look here. So I'm not going to go through the style of cause because it's long. There's lots of people involved in this. However, we'll look at the order and reasons. So these six applications for judicial review concern the validity of the regulations made by the governor and council under section 117.15 of the criminal code to prohibit a list of previously non-restricted or restricted firearms. In fact, the majority of the firearms that were named were previously non-restricted. The coalition for gun control seeks leave to intervene in these proceedings to make submissions with respect to the regulations. It initially requested permission to uh, serve and file an affidavit providing relevant evidence to support its argument, but later advised the court that it no longer intends to do so. The respondent, that's the government of Canada, by the way, um, is of the view that the coalition brings a unique perspective to the debate and that leave should be granted. Of course they do, because the government of Canada wants, these, uh, wants the order in council to stand up. Uh, they want it to be upheld. And what do you think the coalition for gun control is going to be uh, pitching? Yes, we would totally like this other person to come in and support our arguments. So, yeah, that's uh, not surprising. On the other hand, the applicants in five of the six files, uh, and one of them doesn't take a position, uh, so five of the six files oppose the motion or alternatively request that the scope of the coalition's proposed intervention be limited. All right, continuing on. Nature of the intervention. The Coalition is a non-profit organization founded in the wake of the 1989 École Polytechnique massacre in Montreal. It is dedicated to the strengthening and defense of Canada's firearms laws. Um, now, they say strengthening and defense. Uh, they want them to be more and more strict, and they will never be satisfied with whatever the firearm laws are. Since its inception in 1991, the Coalition has advocated for a ban on civilian-owned military-style assault weapons. In fact, they advocate for a ban on firearms in general, and supported strategies to reduce firearm-related deaths, injuries, and crime. The Coalition is supported by over 200 organizations that represent diverse interests spanning the full breadth of Canadian society, including victims, women, physicians, lawyers, not all lawyers, um, religious communities, universities, municipal governments, and law enforcement. Many of these organizations represent victims of gun violence and communities that are disproportionately affected by firearm violence. Of course, I also represent communities who are disproportionately affected by overly strict laws. All right, carrying on. I'm just being a little snarky here. According to its president, Dr. Wendy Sukier, the coalition will bring uh, to bear the distinct voices of those Canadians that the regulations seek to protect. These voices include victims of gun violence and suicide, and groups such as racialized and religious communities, women and minority groups that are more likely to be victims of hate crimes. Dr. Sukier states that the existing parties do not represent the interests of these groups and individuals, and that it is essential that the court hears their voices. So that's her argument for why they should be allowed to, uh, to step in on this matter. The Regulatory Impact Analysis Statement, which accompanies the regulations. So if you've looked at the regulations, and I have previous videos covering this, um, they have a, a statement that goes with it, which is basically just the government's attempt to justify the regulations, and includes a summary of the consultation process, 
states that many participants expressed their views that a ban on assault-style firearms was needed to protect public safety. Assault-style firearms, of course, is a meaningless term in the same way that, you know, beef-style food is a meaningless term. All it tells you when you say something is a something-style item is that it's not the thing. You know, if you say beef-style food, you know that there is not a speck of beef in it. So, assault-style firearms means not assault firearms. All right, carrying on here. Uh, the regulatory impact uh, analysis statement contains several references to the regulations addressing increasing public demand and a growing public concern, and at one point notes a clear need for immediate action to implement the ban on the prescribed prohibited firearms. Of course, uh, this was brought in in the wake of a shooting where the... Uh, the RCMP knew they had multiple reports that this guy illegally had firearms, and they did nothing for the space of a decade. So maybe there's just some requirements to enforce the existing laws and not restrict sports shooters. Carrying on here, uh, the coalition participated in the public consultation process that preceded the regulations, and in my view, it has a genuine interest in the adjudication of any challenge to the regulations. So this is part of the test is, you know, do you actually have an interest in what happens or are you just kind of a tourist? So they're saying, yeah, they, they have an interest. And fair enough, this is what the coalition is about. Uh, that's not an unreasonable finding for the court to make. If granted intervener status, the coalition will, one, argue that the regulations are valid and two, make submissions on the following. So first, the relationship between the prohibitions and regulation and its stated purposes. And second, the social impacts of the regulations from the perspective of experts in violence prevention and groups disproportionately affected by firearm violence. Of course, very little firearm violence is involves any of these particular firearms. Um, the AR-15 is used in fewer homicides than pretty much anything you could name. You know, rocks are probably used in more homicides in the average year in Canada. Um, Liberal government, you really don't need to ban rocks. Please don't get any ideas here. All right, carrying on. Issues. These motions raise the following issues. First, should the coalition be granted leave to intervene in these proceedings? And if so, what is the appropriate scope of intervention for the coalition? So that's what the court is going to be addressing here. So analysis. First question, should the coalition be granted leave to intervene in these proceedings? And so they're going to go through the applicable law here. Leave to intervene may be granted under Rule 109 of the Federal Court's Rules, considering the following relevant factors. And so this is from a number of different cases. I'm not going to go through the cases they cite here, but these are the factors that the court will consider. First, is the proposed intervener directly affected by the outcome, or does the proposed intervener have a genuine interest and possess specialized knowledge and expertise on the issues before the court? And this makes sense, right? You don't want an intervener who's just a tourist who might be there just to put their name on a court proceeding or something like that. They have to actually, this has to matter to the intervener in some fashion. And the court has already said that this portion of the test uh, seems to be made out. So second, is there a justiciable issue and a veritable public interest? Uh, so that just means, you know, is there an issue that the court can hear and that is of that matters to people in general is there an apparent lack of any other reasonable or efficient means to submit the question to the court so interveners are often uh, may often have a very different spin on things so for instance there may be a challenge between somebody uh, importing a variety of books and the government but an intervener might say, listen, these books are important to us as a community because they might be a minority group or whatever else. And so that's a situation where the intervener may have a unique perspective that will otherwise not be in, not be captured. So that's part of the, the considerations that get looked at here. So next, is the position of the proposed intervener adequately defended by one of the parties to the case? You want the intervener to have a unique perspective, you know, to bring something new to the table because what the intervener status is not to be used for, it's not to just have somebody else to say, we agree. 
you know, because that wouldn't be fair. You've got one side versus the other, and you shouldn't be able to kind of bring in a hype man or a, you know, to back you up. They need to actually have a unique perspective. So E, are the interests of justice better served by the intervention of the proposed intervener? For example, has the matter assumed such a public, important, and complex dimension that the court needs to be exposed to perspectives beyond those offered by the particular parties before the court? And what are the interests of the court and the parties? And has the intervener complied with the requirements of the rules? And next, can the court hear and decide the case or the cause on its merits without the proposed intervener? So is the the intervener necessary or can can we do without them? And they note a proposed intervener need not satisfy all of these factors, and the court has discretion to ascribe the weight it sees fit to any individual factor. The court has the authority to allow intervention on terms and conditions that are appropriate in the circumstance. So these are sort of a collection of questions the court needs to consider, but it's not something where they have to tick every box in order to make it in. Uh, this is a, a balancing act. It's an exercise of the court's discretion. Uh, so this is kind of a place where the court gets to make a judgment call. In a recent decision rendered by a full bench of the Federal Court of Appeal, and they cite the case, uh, Justice Roussel citing another recent decision rendered by Justice Stratus, and, and they give a citation here. I'm not going to go through all the citations. Uh, held that the central issue in a motion for leave to intervene is whether the arguments made by the proposed intervener will assist the court in determination of the factual and legal issues raised by the parties, and only those raised by the parties. So they have to look at those issues. They can't sort of start splitting the case up into other things. They can offer a different perspective on those issues, like a different viewpoint as to why these things matter, but they can't open up like entirely new fields of, uh, of consideration here. It's got to be sort of isolated to what's going on, and it has to be helpful to the court. The whole point of this is that it's helpful to the court in making good decisions. You don't want to have people sort of leading the court astray. In Right to Life Association, Justice Stratus reminded us that Parliament's intent is paramount and that Rule 109 should prevail over the court's decisions, and usefulness is central to Rule 109. And Rule 109 is the rule on interveners. The proposed intervener should be able to convince the court at the leave stage, so that's when they're asking for permission to insert themselves into this case, on summary submissions that they will bring to the table useful submissions, insight, and perspectives on the issues raised that are different from that of the parties to the case. Once that is established, the court will look into whether the proposed intervener has a genuine interest in the case and whether it is in the interest of justice to grant leave. In the case before me, I have no doubt that the coalition has a genuine interest in participating in the debate that is at the heart of its reason for existence. And as I said already, um, this seems like a reasonable conclusion on this point. I also have no doubt that it would bring a unique insight and perspective on the factual issues at stake. Um, unique is not necessarily good. However, not only will the coalition not be filing its own evidence, whoops, you, you heard how they had said that they were going to file their own evidence, and then they said, now nah, we're not going to do that. Well, that's a point against them. Uh, but Dr. Sukir admitted on cross-examination that she had not reviewed the numerous affidavits and extensive documentary evidence filed by all the parties in support of the respective positions. So think about this. Um, she didn't do her homework. And, you know, you're sitting there, you're working on a complex, uh, factual and intellectual challenge, and you show up and you're like, I'm here to help, and I haven't read any of the stuff. Well, what help are you? Um... I think it takes some tremendous, um, let's call it courage. Courage is a generous way to put it, but um, it takes some tremendous gumption to show up in court and say, I'm going to be helpful to the court here based on having read none of this stuff. I mean, come on. All right, and 
you know what? We're going to take a little bit of a break here from this, uh, from reading the case here, just to illustrate from the cross-examination transcript uh, what was going on here. And this is just one portion. The cross-examination transcript is um, almost 300 pages, so I'm not going to go through the entirety of it, but we'll just look at a little vignette where she admits that she has not done her homework. And that is right here. So Ms. Jenneru is asking the questions, um, and she is there as a self-represented party. So um, good work on these questions here. Um, she's not the only person who asked these questions, I'll just note, but I'm going to kind of shine a spotlight on her here because this is pretty badass, honestly. So Ms. Jenneru asks, right, so if you, you have not read the application for judicial review or the notice of constitutional question, nor my affidavit, nor the affidavit of my co-applicant, I assume. And the answer is, at this stage, no. Well, this is the stage when they're actually determining whether or not she should be there as, you know, allowed leave. So this was the homework due date. Oh, I'll totally do it in future is not, you know, it was due today. You don't have your homework. You get a zero. All right, carrying on. Okay. Nor the affidavits of any of the people. Gregory Allard from the Pink Pistols. Linda, and I'm going to try here, uh, Kieko, the Olympian. Bruce Gold, the historian. Or Alan Harding, the sports shooter. At this stage, no. Again, I haven't done my homework. Um, yeah. And so the questions continue. So... And you also said earlier that you had not reviewed the AGC, the Attorney General of Canada's legal arguments or affiant's affidavits. That's correct. And counsel for the Attorney General steps in here to say, yeah, she's answered that question. The answer was yes. So, um, yeah. And then, uh, so Ms. Kukier, how can, or Sukie, uh, how can your lawyer maintain in your written representations then that your interests are not adequately defended by any of the existing parties if you don't know the arguments and positions of the existing parties. Yeah, um, that's that's wonderful here. And uh, I think that's a, a wonderful little bit of questioning there. And yeah, it's... Uh, That's a beautiful little bit, and that, um, you know, this bit and other bits like it, because as I said, uh, there were lots of people involved here, lots of lawyers asking questions, uh, but, you know, this ends up being fatal to Sukir's position here. So, let's continue. In that context, the court has to focus on what the coalition intends to argue on the issues that are raised by the parties, which all turn around the administrative and constitutional validity of the regulations. In its reply submissions, the coalition states that it has now had the opportunity to review the respondents' written submissions. Hey, um, it's a little late, but we've done part of our homework now. This is really depressing, actually. Uh, yet, it fails to identify how the legal arguments it intends to make would differ from those of the respondent, or how it intends to approach these issues from a different angle. This is a really massive uh, failure on the part of the coalition. They're just not addressing the critical elements of the test that the court needs to consider here. Um, I have no idea how this came to be, but um, they're kind of dunking on themselves. So what the coalition has been advocating for over the past 30 years has found its way in large part into the uh, the analysis statement issued with the regulations and in the respondent's evidentiary record filed with the court. In fact, the very perspective the coalition would bring forward is reflected at the onset of the analysis statement, and I'm not going to read this big block of text because it's a big block of text, uh, but they this is basically talking about uh, mass shooting events. So skipping on here. In addition to its arguments on the administrative and constitutional fronts, that is exactly the perspective the respondent will be defending on the merits of these applications. Conclusion, therefore, for the foregoing reasons, I will dismiss the motions. 
So, uh, Wendy uh, Sukir is not going to be permitted to uh, to intervene on this matter. The Coalition for Gun Control not going to be permitted to uh, to intervene in this matter. And we can just see here, uh, you know, bring this up here. This court orders that the motions made by the Coalition for Gun Control are dismissed and no costs are granted. So nobody has to pay any money over this. It's just you don't get you don't get to play. You didn't do your homework. You don't get to, to join in. Um, you get to sit on the sidelines and and watch like most of the rest of us. So that um, that's really kind of sad is really what it comes down to because how um, how they fail to to do those things that they should have uh, that they should have taken care of I I just don't know. Um, it just makes no sense to me, and yet here we are. So a lot of people were asking, you know, hey, can you explain what's going on here? So, um, you know, uh, and I just want to note here, just, uh, it looks like they had written submissions by uh, four separate lawyers. Uh, so I don't, I don't know what's going on there, but... Uh, this is a real failure on the part of the Coalition for Gun Control to just handle what they needed to do. Um, lots of people have said, you know, hey, what's going on here? How did this happen? I hope this video provides a little bit more explanation as to sort of why the court did that. Now, you know, the court is basically saying, listen, I have no evidence here that their submissions are necessary, that they're going to be helpful, that they're going to be in any way different from what the government themselves is going to be arguing. Because the government, of course, is going to be there to bring their own perspective and to make their own, uh, make their arguments, and they already rely on this sort of thing. So they don't get to have the, the sort of Me Too uh, hype man voice here. This is a win for Canadian gun owners, but it's a win on, you know, as part of a larger... Um, a larger battle here. There's going to be a lot more battles left to fight in this uh, particular uh, proceeding. So I'll, uh, whenever sort of there's a development, I'll try to offer a little bit more context. And hopefully this is now a little more clear to a lot of people. Anyway, um, let me know in the comments section below if there's any questions you guys still have on all of this. Uh, please like this video, share it with your friends, subscribe to see more content. All of that is very helpful for keeping the channel growing and um, sort of feeding the algorithm. I also want to thank my Patreon supporters at the $50 level, Canada's National Firearms Association, the CCFR, and the Canadian Shooting Sports Association. Um, I should note that as much as they are channel sponsors, they get no in, you know, input into the perspectives I take or what I say. Um, I say, you know, so this is not a paid message or anything along those lines. I say what I think. Um, I also, at the $30 level, Sights and Arms Limited. And at the $20 level, Mark, Jane, Babe, and Luxor, Haywire, Dale Nesbitt, Cameron Johnson, Bruno R., Andrew Elsich, and Vicky. Thank you as well to the $10 supporters who will be in the crawl immediately following. Thank you for watching. I hope this has armed you with knowledge. And see you next time. And, um... Wendy, if you're watching, ouch, um, I almost feel bad. That's got to be kind of embarrassing. Anyway, um, see you folks.